Hello everyone and welcome to Yoga Berry, your yoga for scoliosis community. Welcome to Back Chat, which is my weekly live stream here on YouTube. It's happening at um, 4 p.m. every Wednesday. Um, so that's UK time, 4 p.m. Now, last week, I have to apologize. Last week, I wasn't very well, so I had to skip a week. But usually, I am here. And um, usually, I have some guests as well. And I will talk to you about my guest um, that I've got on today in a minute. But um, yeah, so this is, a, this is a show where I talk about, um, we talk about yoga, we talk about scoliosis, we talk about um, different treatments that are out there that are available. So really, I believe that knowledge is power and I believe that um, we need to share what, what we know about scoliosis. I love talking to, to different e experts who've got um, sometimes different opinions in terms of how to treat scoliosis and, and um, what to do. But I think the important thing is that we all come together and, and share what we know and making sure that people have access to that knowledge as well and um, giving people the opportunity to, to see all the amazing things that are out there for scoliosis sufferers and that you are not alone. There's lots and lots of other people that are going through the same thing um, that you do. Good. So I'm super excited today. I've got um, Dr. Tony Nalda, and he's the chairman of the board of directors for Clear Institute, Clear Scoliosis Institute. He's a lead trainer for Scolibrace in North America, and he's the founder of the Scoliosis Reduction Center, which is one of the largest alternative scoliosis centers in the U.S. And there's plenty of other things as well, and I'm sure he will talk to us um, a little bit more about his very impressive resume, but let me bring him on here. So here he is. Welcome. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing really great. Good. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to me today. I really love this. I love that we can um, connect with with people from all over the world. I'm here in the UK. You You are in Florida. You are in the US and just um, sharing all that amazing knowledge. So I, um, I read actually in your bio that you started to kind of get into the, the field of chiropractic because of your own struggles or, or maybe as a, as a patient and um, suffering from migraine, is that right? Yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, I woke up at around 10 years of age with a, with a migraine um, that didn't go away for about seven years. And um, progressively, it wasn't like I had a day with no migraine. It's just how bad the migraine was at that time. Yeah. And um, interesting enough, my, my mom was actually buying me some pharmaceuticals and medications in a pharmacy, uh, something called Imitrex. And back then, Imitrex was done with an injectable, right? So I had to inject myself um, regularly with this drug. Um, and somebody mentioned, hey, why don't you, you know, why don't you try chiropractic? I, I, I had headaches and migraines and it helped me. So my mom, you know, unknowingly didn't know why, but took me to a chiropractor. And, and as a result of it, you know, my, my migraines drastically improved to the point where they were gone. And I, so I decided I, this is a profession I wanted to do. So I, I, I decided to become a chiropractor at that point, which I was actually going to be moving into the more traditional medical profession. I was going to want to become a medical doctor at the time, but I completely switched. And that was at 17 years of age when I um, got my first chiropractic adjustment. Wow, okay, amazing. And then how did you, um, because obviously working with, with people with scoliosis is quite, is very specialist. Mm -hmm. How did you kind of, um, how did you get into this field? Was it just, do you have any personal experience with scoliosis or was it just kind of a professional interest? Yeah, so, um, you know, early in my career, I built a very, a very successful clinic here in Florida, and I was seeing lots of patients, and I was seeing uh, a lot of patients, unfortunately, with scoliosis, and what I would see is I would take care of patients using just, you know, traditional or typical chiropractic approaches, and I wasn't necessarily seeing the results I would want, and I knew or I felt that I could help these patients better. So in particularly, I had a patient that came in with scoliosis and things were not changing. And in fact, I was seeing progression. 
So I was saying there's got to be a better way. And that's when I discovered and found Dr. Wogan, the founder of Clear Institute. And I actually traveled with the patient to, the, to, uh, to Dr. Wogan's office in Minnesota. And I kind of got my eyes open to what's possible in the chiropractic realm regarding taking care of scoliosis. Mm. And I was like, well, this is something that needs to be shared. It needs to be used and we need to get it to more doctors. And so therefore I became intricately involved with the Clear Institute. And currently now, obviously it's my main focus in my practice is with scoliosis. Interesting as personal experience is uh, my wife uh, has scoliosis, mild scoliosis, not so severe, but she does. And her daughter was developing a scoliosis that was progressing and we were able to stop it and reduce it. So I have two family members uh, that do have scoliosis. Brilliant. Yeah. And I think once you kind of um, dig a little bit deeper, you, you realize how many people are out there that suffer yeah. from, from scoliosis, isn't it? Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. So um, what is kind of just for, for, for those people, including myself, who are sometimes a little bit confused about the, the differences of the, the different therapies, how would you describe what a chiropractor does compared to what a, a physiotherapist, I think you call them physical therapist, um, yeah. does or an osteopath, for example? Yeah, so that's a great question because in the U.S. it's it's very different. Um, I'm not sure how it is in um, obviously in different countries of the world, but um, in the United States, you know, let's kind of start off with um, you know like the osteopath. The osteopath in the U.S. at this point is is pretty much an MD. Um, the people that are graduating osteopath schools are pretty much have, this, uh, have the mindset of um, of treating people medically and mm -hmm. mostly with medications and drugs. Um, there are given some types of uh, therapeutic knowledge, but it's very, very minor. I, I did a presentation in the University of South Florida residency programs to their residents, and then half of them were osteopaths. And I actually thought the osteopaths would have a greater knowledge when it came to spinal biomechanics or spinal rehabilitation. And not really. I mean, they, they were very entry level. They didn't really understand the full biomechanics when it came to scoliosis. Mm -hmm. So they're almost specialized just like an MD would. Okay. So, um, however, in the past, osteopaths were known for kind of like having osteopathic manipulation, which sometimes can be confused for what a chiropractic adjustment is, but they're slightly different. And a lot of and osteopaths don't even do that anymore. It's not even in their training. It's kind of like an elective in their course or, um, where, Uh, physical therapists in, in the U.S. are more muscle-based, soft mm -hmm. tissue-based. They're looking at you know, working with muscles and, and trying to rehabilitate injuries. You know, when I look at a physical therapist, it's about rehabilitating injury, rehab rehabilitating um, those types of problems with soft tissue. Now, chiropractic, you know, it's funny, we we're talking about this actually before we got on, on, on live here, is there's also a wide spectrum you know, within right. chiropractic. But, you know, chiropractic foundation is based upon dealing with the spine in an alignment way, meaning that making sure the spine's in the proper alignment to mostly deal with the neurology of the spine, meaning that chiropractic foundation is built on that. If we can realign the spine into a better position, we can remove nerve pressure and allow the body to heal and function at a higher mm -hmm. level. That's the foundation which chiropractic is built upon. However, the techniques used to help that spinal alignment is where the variance exists. You know, there are some chiropractors who only deal upper cervically with the first top two bones of the neck. There are some chiropractors who deal with only the pelvis and there's some chiropractors that deal with more segmental misalignments. And then there's chiropractors that deal more with a rehabilitative approach using more rehabil rehab with associated with spinal, with spinal movement. Yeah. And then there's some chiropractors that do more of a tonal based, like they're dealing more with symptoms and just trying to relieve symptoms. And then lastly, of course, there's chiropractors like myself who try to take all those components and put them into a program like that's going to be specific for scoliosis. Right. Okay, good. So before we kind of get further, further into this, I just want to acknowledge those people that are watching live here. So thank you so much if you if you made the time to to come here live. Um, so feel free to, I will keep going with my questions, obviously, for Dr. Nalda, but if you've got any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. I will keep an eye on it. When I'm looking away, that's where I'm looking. I'm not ignoring you. Um, so I can see Tatiana is, is here. So she's saying good morning. Thank you for all that you do. So she's in Canada. 
So, hi, Tatiana. Um, so, anyone else, obviously, yes, if you're here, let us know where you're from. Let us know what your questions are for um, Dr. Nalda. Good. So, uh, why don't we talk a little bit more about um, that, the, that specific work that you do for um, those that suffer from scoliosis? And as, as far as I understand, it's not just... So, obviously, when I think of a chiropractor, I think about uh, someone who's clicking my spine a lot yeah right and um yes not so pleasant sometimes yeah, yeah. usually i feel better afterwards yeah. for sure for sure it's no different like holding a yoga pose that you know that's uncomfortable yeah, yeah not absolutely pleasant. fair uh, enough fair you enough you can feel better afterwards you do feel better 100%. afterwards there has to be a little bit so. of suffering right but <laughs> absolutely so when it comes to chiropractic and the adjustment the chiropractic adjustment is what you're referring to it's mm -hmm. you know it's techniques and there's sometimes there's instruments or manual adjustments or tables there's different ways to actually adjust the spine and the adjustment is like more about restoring motion and mobility and removing segmental differences between one bone relative to another mm -hmm. but i don't think there's any real significant data out there that shows reliably over a period of series of just doing adjustments is gonna influence the scoliosis. However, it may help people with pain, meaning so we have a lot of patients, before I was doing specific scoliosis work, I would have patients come in with scoliosis, especially adult patients that were experiencing pain and would provide you know, to dip, typical chiropractic care and they would feel better. Mm -hmm. um, but when I would see pre and post x-rays or monitor them for a period of time, there was very little influence on the actual structure of the spine. So what we understood or we started learning was there have to be more involvement, that be more involvement than just doing an adjustment, mm -hmm. even though adjustment has a great benefit. I don't want to discount the power of, you know, adjusting or, you know, providing a nerve interference removal or reducing nerve pressure, what that can do for somebody. Um, obviously one adjustment had a great change on my life. So I don't want to discount that, but mm -hmm. If we want to consistently get a change in somebody's x-ray, meaning we want to start reducing the curve in a consistent manner, we have to apply typically more types of treatment. What are those treatments? Well, it's not just one. It's normally a combination of treatments that are designed specifically for scoliosis. So when we look at a program that's consistent, we look at doing some soft tissue work like a physical therapist would do. Mm -hmm. We look at doing some scoliosis specific exercises like maybe um, like a Schroff therapist or a CS therapist, or maybe even a yoga specific instructor for scoliosis would provide. We look at doing uh, passive rehabilitation that uses machines and vibrations and tractions to help mobilize and increase flexibility of the spine. Yeah. We also do um, customized corrective bracing that sometimes uh, patients would need in order to correct their spine like an orthotist would do. So when we look at our treatment in our clinic, it's, it's not just one box. You know, there's a lot of boxes that we have to fill mm. to make this comprehensive approach work. And so therefore, when somebody thinks, oh, I'm a chiropractor, I'm just doing adjustments and that's not going to work. Well, I, I agree. If you, I'm saying I'm a chiropractor, but I'm doing all this box of treatment or therapies, it's a different outcome. You know, it's like, comparing a, uh, a car, like, again, yeah, we look at a car has four wheels, it's made of metal and has seats and it's a steering wheel, but not all cars are designed the same. Just yeah. like yoga, not all yoga classes are designed the same. I'm sure your yoga in terms of what you teach is probably way more specific for scoliosis than somebody going to the gym across the street and doing a yoga class. Yes. Um, so it's that comparison. Mm. Not, all, you know, not all yogas are the same, just like not all chiropractic clinics that take care of scoliosis are the same. Yeah, yeah, no. I get it. Absolutely. Um, so, so if you, if I was, if I was coming to your, um, to your clinic, for example, so there, there would be different um, people working there. So there would be people that are providing more kind of the, um, the, the chiropractic adjustments, and then maybe somebody who would give me a plan of exercise that I can do at home. Um, yeah. And yeah, is that how it works? Yeah. So what, what, what makes it work also super well is that, so what I just mentioned can be very fragmented. So imagine if I went to a physical therapist, got some physical therapy exercises. Then I went to an orthotist and had a brace designed by an orthotist. Yeah. I went to a chiropractor who provided adjustments. I went to an exercise physiologist that gave me some home exercises and some home rehab. I went to a soft tissue specialist that did their soft tissue work. So everybody's doing their own thing and there's no coordination. Mm. And so what I find is a lot of the things end up working against each other. 
So in our clinic, I coordinate all that to make sure that everything adds to the next. So right. it's a coordinated effort and to make sure that it's very additive. And that's the key because if we, you can get a lot of good things out there, but if they're working in opposite or in opposite mm -hmm. direction, especially if somebody has two or three or four curves, it can actually, some things can actually work against the opposite. Mm -hmm. So that's the, what I find is yes, there is somebody providing all those things, but they're provided under an umbrella of me saying, I want you doing it like this, and I want you doing it like this, and I want you doing it like this. So therefore they're adding They're you know, one plus one plus one will actually equal three, as opposed yeah. to they're all going in different directions. Yeah, I love that. I have, I just actually, that makes me think of, I've just had a, um, a father of a little girl contact me and she is, uh, she's 12 and um she has got quite a severe curve i think it's in the 70 degrees or something like that so she's definitely heading down the surgery um direction and because of covid obviously this is all delayed and the, the surgeries yeah. are not happening so they are panicking obviously and they're they're wanting to do everything and they're wanting to do everything that you know and completely understandable i've got children i would do exactly the same um but sometimes if, if there's too much and too many different approaches that are not coordinated, yeah. um, you don't know what's, what's and even me as, as someone working with, with people with scoliosis, if I know they are under a different program, I would be quite hesitant because, you know, I don't know what they do there and I don't know if that's going to work together. So I love that you've, you're kind of bringing it all in and, and having this coordinated um, approach and not saying that just one thing is going to make all the difference, but it's probably the combination of everything. Yeah, you know, and I, I take it my as my responsibility to coordinate with their other doctors, like so, or other therapists. I obviously I don't do like massage in my office, but I have a lot of patients that use massage. So I will talk to the massage therapist, tell them what I'm trying to do. So therefore, there's a coordinated effort in delivering. So therefore, she she can use her training to try to match my effort at the same time. Yeah. And you know, obviously, I see patients from typically all over the world, but right now only U.S. patients for obvious reasons, but I even coordinate with their local doctors. So let's say um, I may be seeing them personally for their scoliosis for a period of time, but I'll refer them back to their chiropractor locally. I will also coordinate with their chiropractor to make sure that we're coordinated in efforts because the coordination is what matters. Yes. And all too often in a, in a patient with scoliosis, their care is very fragmented, mm. um, very fragmented, and they're very confused about well, what do I need to do? And, and is this person telling me to do the same thing that this other person's doing? And are there an opposite, opposition? And, um, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. You know, if with an open mind, like you said, having knowledge and, and, and working together, understanding that there's more than one way to go out a problem, if we just work together at the patient's best interest, we'll get to a good result, you know? Mm, yes, yeah, absolutely. Let me just have a quick look at the um, chat here. So we've got um, good morning from Philadelphia. Hello. We've got someone from Qatar. Thank you for sharing this. Um, can the program improve the, uh, improve the curvature without surgery? Great question. <laughs> yeah. So let's just get to the very point right let's now. Get, <laughs> right. Let's, yeah, let's stop the everything around. Just tell us. Yeah, <laughs> Is this going to? So, um, you know, to answer that question, you know, simply is yes, curves can be reduced in almost any age, the degree of reduction is gonna be variant, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and how much we can reduce a curve is, you know, it's gonna be really dependent upon the flexibility of the spine, which is where yoga can actually have a great effect and the discipline of the patient, okay? And, but the understand is that the, the model or the modality of the way it's done needs to be changed. And this is what we were hinting to a little bit in the beginning. and. I feel like I have to talk a little bit about Clear Institute to make to answer that question properly. Okay. Chiropractors, therapists, rehab specialists are all kind of trained in a way to treat injuries. Mm -hmm. So when a patient has an injury or something like they would they would injure themselves, they they use rehabilitative techniques that have been proven to um, help stabilize and improve injury. So you go see your chiropractor, you go to your physical therapist, you go to your massage therapist, and you do slow therapy over a long time. And it's normally done um, very slowly, like very slowly. If you're over maybe, maybe three times a week, twice a week for a period of three to six months, and that's how you rehabilitate an injury. And it's effective. I mean, there's no question. Um, no matter what type of 
therapeutic approach you choose to use. Well, Dr. Wogan, um, the founder of Clear Institute, had a patient uh, that uh, a friend of his that had daughter had scoliosis and was doing that. And just like I noticed, he noticed that this typical therapeutic approach um, wasn't really influencing a curve. It helps people with maybe an injury, but scoliosis isn't an injury. Scoliosis is a developmental problem that patients have had and have developed over a long time, whether it be adult onset or whether it be adolescent scoliosis in the adult. Normally this thing has been there for a while. It's not like it's an acute problem that happens right now. It's not an injury. Yeah. So these approaches used to treat injuries are just not effective. And therefore they think, so a lot of that patients will say, oh, well, I tried therapy or I tried exercises or I tried something like that, but they did it in a, in a way to help manage an injury, not reduce the scoliosis. Mm. So what Clear Institute revolutionized, and they were the first institute or the first organization to ever develop anything like this, was something called intensive care. Now, it's been mimicked and changed and names have been changed with other organizations, whether it be called the boot camp or whatever that, but we've taken this long therapeutic model that normally is done to treat injuries and we condense it down into a very intense model. And the person will take this therapeutic rehabilitative program and do it condensed over one to two weeks. And the goal is to rapidly improve the flexibility and mobility and reduce the curve as much as we can in a short duration, not a long, because a long duration, there's too much chance for it to bounce back. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of throwing a ball against the wall. So we want a very rapid um, change in the flexibility or improvement or reduction of the curvature. Then we use traditional types of therapeutic approaches like home therapy, like practicing yoga, like all the things that you would do traditionally, you would think to handle um, an injury, we do that afterwards to help hold the reduction. So it's very similar to the approach that orthodontists use with braces on teeth, that you try to get, you know, you go into the orthodontist, they'll put a set of braces on and they kind of put them in a place to move your teeth a very small amount, but very quickly within a couple of weeks, your teeth hurt like crazy. You can't chew, you can't eat. And then, um, you know, for the next 90 days before you go back in, your teeth are just being stabilized. Mm-hmm. Then you go back in 90 days later, orthodontists, they tighten the braces even tighter. They move really quick within a week or two. And then you're just holding the teeth that way for the next 90 days. And then you would keep repeating that cycle to eventually get your teeth as straight as they can possibly get. Mm-hmm. It's the same model is we, it's periods of rapid reduction with periods of stabilization in between. Mm. And those jumps like that happen like this, the degree and how much we can reduce is gonna depend on size of curve, flexibility of spine, age of patient, discipline, how well they follow through. There's a lot of factors involved, but the ultimate answer is yes, if the approach is correct. Mm. So are you saying that, um, uh, first of all, I think it's interesting that you talk about flexibility and mobility. which sometimes, so I don't know how much you know about the Schross approach, mm-hmm. but I sometimes feel that they don't like that. <laughs> they- yes, yes. So, and they have, a, they have a point, they have a point. Yeah. You know, I always have a saying or a, a rule that I treat patients by, you don't mobilize anything you're not going to stabilize. Right, okay. Because, especially in an adult patient, because if you mobilize something that you don't stabilize, you have the chance of actually making curves worse and quicker right. yeah and which is has been shown you know and we've shown that, that if you like especially in, like in uh, osteopathic adjustments or manipulations they're very mobilizing they're more mobilizing than a chiropractic adjustment chiropractic adjustments tend to be more specific but they're you know when people talk about manipulation they throw all manipulations into one like box like they do with yoga and um so if you really mobilize spines aggressively and do nothing to stabilize them mm. potentially you could uh, lead them to more progression yeah yeah absolutely and i mean just from just from experience talking you know um dealing with with different ages um i certainly would work very differently with a with a with a young person with a teenager than i would work with someone who's 50 years old and um has got completely different problems obviously with their spine isn't it for sure Good. Let me just have a quick look here. So um, Mecca is saying, I also have scoliosis, especially I have nerve compression issue in my neck. So how can you resolve those issues by chiropractic? Yeah. So what I think she's addressing to is, you know, what happens to the cervical spine in response to a 
a scoliosis. And typically it's going to be a thoracic scoliosis that's going to affect the neck more. Mm -hmm. So what we do know when scoliosis first happens in adolescent cases, it leads to a hypo, hypo or lessened kyphosis yeah. in the thoracic spine. The flattening of the thoracic spine will automatically lead to a flattening of the cervical spine. Mm -hmm. so the flattening of the cervical spine will lead to that loss of lordosis, which makes the cervical spine less adaptive to compressive forces over time, because that curve in your neck is what your body, how your body adapts to those forces. So what happens is you move into adult phase, gravity is pushing down on a curve that doesn't, that you're supposed to have a, a, a lordosis, you don't have it, it compresses down and now it leads to nerve compression like she's describing. And that's the, the late stage or later stage, that's like the adolescent scoliosis in the adult case that's now becoming degenerative. Right which leads to nerve compression. So how do you improve that? The way you improve it is by getting those curves reduced, start improving that kyphosis in the thoracic spine, improving the lordosis in the neck. And that all has to be done in coordination with trying to reduce the thoracic cob angle as well. Mm -hmm. So that's all this like three-dimensional turning. So the way you do that is by improving it. The only way it can be improved is what I mentioned before is that combination of therapies and rehab to get the structural change. Mm. There could be a lot of things done palliatively, meaning palliatively, like if you choose a more traditional medical approach, they will use injections and medications and those kinds of things. If you use more of a therapeutic approach, they will be using exercises, maybe muscle stim and electrical therapy and that kind of stuff to help um, deal with the symptoms. What we try to deal with in the Clear Institute is we try to deal with the underlying structure meaning if we can improve the structure, we believe we can influence those two factors um, by removing the pressure so the body can start healing and repairing itself, right? And that's really what we're trying to do in the Institute or with our methods. Mm. Um, just coming back to those, so you were talking about the natural curves of the, of the spine. So looking from someone from the side, obviously you were saying that with scoliosis, those curves are flattened, right? So there's less yeah. of a, um, a kyphosis, there's, there's less of a lordosis. Is that the same in the lumbar spine? Would you say that as well? That there's well, a... it's funny, the lumbar spine, they tend to get hyperlordotic. So the typical, right. typical scenario is they have a very flat chest and a, their butt's very back. Right. And that's the most common posture in a scoliosis patient. Now, interesting, when curves get severe, it starts inverting. They start getting typhal scoliosis because the body's trying to stabilize. Mm. And that can happen late in late stage progression as, as an adult. So normally we're trying to bring the butt under their, their, under their rib cage, bring their rib cage back over their butt and improve the curve in their neck. Yeah. Okay. Um, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> can, let's, talk about, let's talk about pain um, a little bit more maybe. So um, we would we were just very briefly chatting be, beforehand, obviously as well, and we were we were talking about you know how it's different, obviously for for children that usually don't suffer from pain, and then you've got the um, the adults usually that that do suffer from pain. So is there kind of a uh, where does it change? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great question and it, and it creates a lot of confusion. And actually I believe it creates a lot of confusion even for the medical practitioner that doesn't know about scoliosis. So a lot of times an adult patient will go into a, a medical practitioner you know, in their 30s and 40s and they said they've had scoliosis their whole life. So they'll think their scoliosis has no impact on their pain because you had scoliosis your whole life, you have pain now, so therefore it can't be your scoliosis, right? Yeah. What they're not understanding is what happens to scoliosis over time. So kids when or uh, adolescents, when they're developing their scoliosis and the curve is, the curve is progressing, what everybody knows it's a result of growth. It's a result of their elongation. And therefore, because they're elongating, the curve is progressing. The biggest curve I've ever seen in a child, like I was telling you earlier, is 155 degrees. Mm -hmm. So you think if a curve size was caused pain, this child would have debilitating pain but the child had none, hardly right. any. And in fact, if kids feel pain, it's a, it's a dull ache at the site of curve and it's very mild and it's really no different than some other kids that could have. So we, we, we say there's very little pain of anything associated with scoliosis. Mm -hmm. If kids have pain 
in scoliosis, we look at it as a red flag, that there could be another condition associated with their scoliosis, something within their spinal cord, something else. Right. Now, there are some cases that do, but the majority, vast majority of cases have no pain or very mild pain when it comes to scoliosis. Unfortunately, that's why a lot of cases aren't treated. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of kids have no pain. So the parents say, well, I'm not going to worry about it because the kid has no pain. They're not supposed to have pain. Unfortunately, when they move into adult stage, they stop growing. Um, the curve now kind of settles in place. And then a lot of uh, patients feel like, okay, my curve isn't going to worsen anymore because I'm no longer growing. In fact, even a lot of medical doctors um, or doctors or practitioners that don't know and understand scoliosis will say, don't worry about it anymore. In fact, the average person I talked to in their 40s were told back then not to worry about it. Hmm. But then we know today that's wrong. Curves still progress. They progress much slower, but they still progress. Um, anywhere from a half a degree to a couple degrees a year, depending on your size of curve, activity levels and whatnot. It's this slow progression over time that becomes painful because this slow progression is a result of gravity or compressive forces pushing down on the spine, which now will affect the nerves and the discs and the muscles and the tissues. And that becomes painful. Right. right? Okay. So it's in that transition phase that when they move from um, you know, adolescent into young adulthood, somewhere in that progressive phase when it starts increasing, what I've noticed clinically, it's about to, anywhere, it's about 10% of their curve size. If they start getting 10 to 15% of their curve size increasing, they start experiencing it. Right. So I can have an adult with a 30 degree curve that maybe stopped growing at 25, progressed to 30, they're going to have start having pain, where I can have an adolescent with a 100 degree curve and have no pain. Mm. Got it. So it's how much they progress as an adult, which is what matters. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's there's usually I I find there is a time like around um, fifty maybe. Uh, I would assume it's got something to do with menopause. Is that right? Where where yeah, things so, usually get worse. Yeah. So for the first twenty years, it's they're progressing. They say every twenty years of life, it's going to double its rate of progression. Right. That's just a rule of thumb. Got it. So from 20 to 40, let's say it's progressing a half a degree a year, right? From 40 to 60, right past menopause, it's going to double again. And then it's going to double again at 60 plus. So they say there is some type of increase of progression for women postmenopausal. They don't know if it has to do with menopause or if it's just related to the timing that the scoliosis mm -hmm. has been there. But we do know we see an upward trend, meaning the older you become, the faster your curve progresses and yeah. the bigger your curve becomes the faster it progresses so both things tend to snowball each other okay and in late stage life 60 plus years of age we can see five six seven degrees a year progression and it can be scary at that stage yeah so when i was looking you know through your website you, you wrote an article there that said kind of like you know do's and don'ts regarding yoga for scoliosis and one of the things you said there was be proactive there's probably nothing more important for the adult scoliosis patient is to take care of it before it gets that big, huge snowball that now, like, what do we do now? Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the best piece of one of the best pieces of advice that you wrote in that article. And I agree with it hundred percent. You want to be proactive. Mm. I love that you had a look at my website. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, sure. I always get asked about the, the link between scoliosis and osteoporosis. Is yeah. there, is there one? Well, yes and no, because what ends up happening is, and I, and I like to say yes, because the way bones respond or the way bones stay strong is by a natural neutral compressive force. The compressive force on the body will stimulate bone cells to produce bone to keep you up. Well, obviously, scoliosis patients have an asymmetrical spines. So therefore, they have asymmetrical forces going down into the body. Therefore, they have asymmetrical loads on their bones and their hips and their knees and their joints. So they will get asymmetrical reactions of those bone cells. Mm. Got it. So yeah. that's what leads to this osteoporotic uh, increase in certain areas. And typically, it's going to be asymmetrical. They're yeah. going to have one hip that's weaker than the other. And it's not because they have a necessary a disease. It's just their... They don't have a symmetrical weight stimulating the cells to say produce more bone cells. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, a little yeah, bit. yeah, absolutely. Um, good. So lots of 
questions here coming in. <laughs> um, right. I've been diagnosed with orthopedic by a orthopedic consultant as having mild S curve scoliosis, but PT and Kairos have said I have a leg length di discrepancy of one to one and a half centimeters. Any advice? Um, and is it the cause of scoliosis? or not? Right. So that's a good question because there are a lot of, let's talk about cause. I think that's probably an important yes. thing to talk about, mm -hmm. um, cause of scoliosis. So in adult cases, we have two types, main types, right? We have um, de novo scoliosis or scoliosis that started as an adult, or we have adolescent scoliosis in the adult. Um, in, let's handle the second one, adolescent scoliosis in the adult. So adolescent scoliosis, we, again, we have three main types. We have something called congenital scoliosis, and that's when a patient has a malformed bone within the spine, meaning one of the vertebras are not formed fully. This could also be somewhat equated to maybe having a true leg length deficiency because there's a malformation. It's truly congenital, meaning the person was born with a bone yeah. that didn't fully develop or grow, and that could obviously lead to a curve. So yes, mm -hmm. it could be one of the causes if that's really there. Mm -hmm. The um, second type in an adolescent is something called neuromuscular, that's where a patient has a neuromuscular syndrome, like uh, cerebral palsy, Marfan, something along those lines that can cause scoliosis too. Both those types equal about 10% of all kids. The vast majority of kids are something called idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic is a big fancy word to say, we don't know what's causing it. Okay. And the truth is it's a multifactorial problem. And this is the consensus. Most doctors who specialize in scoliosis understand that there's more than one reason why people get curves. In fact, there's about 70 to 80 theories and they all show some correlation to, they can stimulate a curve progression or curve onset in yeah. somebody's uh, scoliosis or spine. So basically it's telling you the scoliosis is a symptom for another reason. It's not truly the cause. Mm. It's kind of like a fever. There's a lot of reasons why kids get fevers. Whatever causes that fever resolves and the fever goes away. Whatever causes the scoliosis probably goes away in an, in an idiopathic case, but the curve now stays. And now the curve itself becomes structural and progresses during growth. Mm. That's the best way to understand it. Um, so if somebody says, I know the cause of scoliosis, they're guessing because nobody knows the cause. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now in adult cases, it's a little different. In adult cases, it's normally one of two main things. In most cases, it's traumatic, meaning they had no scoliosis and it's assumed it wasn't undiagnosed because a lot of small curves go undiagnosed as an adolescent and they, have, and they progress as an adult and they never knew they had scoliosis as a child. So that's the most common reason. But truly adult onset is one of two cases. It's traumatic. Something, some trauma happens to the spine, causes a shift to the spine, it goes uncorrected and then this unshift will progress into a scoliosis as they get older. Mm -hmm. And then it's be also something called degenerative, meaning that they're doing something that's causing the spine to degenerate in a certain area. The degeneration will lead to, it leads to asymmetrical wear of the spine that could lead to a scoliosis happening as well. Those are the two most common types. The third type is, uh, is typically pathology meaning a fracture within the spine, tumor within the spine, something within the spine that's going to push the curve. That's not a therapeutic case. Those, that's something else going on, right? Yeah. Um, so the first two, though, are. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, just coming back to, to the leg length um, difference, um, I sometimes wonder, because I, I, I fear the same, so I've been told that I have a leg length difference, but I also have a lumbar scoliosis, so you know, could, could one come from the other or is it actually that the leg appears shorter because of the rotation in the Correct. spine and maybe, maybe the rotation in the hip? Yeah. So the only way to really know if you have a leg length difference or not is to take full length leg x-rays, which we do in the clinic uh, from the femur down to the ankle and actually measure yeah. the length of the actual leg. You can't go off the sacrum or the pelvis because we know a twist will appear as a difference on an x-ray mm -hmm. due to radiology rate the way uh the way distortion happens like a picture you know we take a photo of a picture we know if somebody's rotated one part appears higher than the other mm -hmm. um so we know that that the full length like x-ray is important so what's interesting is that we do this and i see cases that that i think would have a leg length deficiency because they have looked like they have a tilted pelvis don't it's more of a twist and i see cases that you know the opposite can happen too 
do. They can twist in a certain way and the leg length can be different. It could appear flat, but they truly have a leg length deficient yeah. deficiency. The only way to know is a full length leg x-ray. Yeah. If there is a leg deficiency, I do recommend lifting it, but never lifting it to neutral, lifting it a little bit less. A little bit because less. You never want to go so far um, because we want to account for there's probably a little bit of error on that measurement. Mm. Right. So that's that's my recommendation is that we do lift them if there's a significant amount. If it's within a few millimeters, no. I think that lady mentioned a centimeter and a half. Yes. You know, um, if, if it's truly there, I would do recommend lifting the leg mm. um, just to balance out the sacrum. But the only way to know is with leg length um, x-rays. Yes, I think that's that's really important. And and mine is, is about the same. And I still question it. And I haven't found anyone who can do like a proper x-ray of it yeah. to, to tell me. Um, but I used to wear a heel lift for, for years. And I feel it was the wrong thing. Um, Again, it it, it very much could be. I mean, I can, it blows me away how unreliable just taking an x-ray of the sacrum or the pelvis is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, good. So Tatiana is asking, what do you think of the Dr. Fishman method? Now, I, I don't know, know if, you're, if, you're, if you're familiar with it, but basically, um, he is basically saying that um, the, the convex side of your curve is where your muscles are long and overstretched. And the, the idea is to strengthen that side as much as possible to bring it back to center. Yeah, and the, 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 obviously a lot of techniques use that to try to strengthen the outside, of the, you know, the, the outside of the curve. You know, what's interesting enough is that they did actually um, muscle stem studies on scoliosis patients where they used muscle stem on the inside and the outside of the curve. And, you know, saying that these curves are, you know, the outside of the curve is weaker and elongated and the inside of the curve is stronger and tighter. So we're gonna use muscle stem to strengthen the outside to artificially strengthen it. And we're gonna use muscle stem to weaken the inside to interrupt the nerve system to weaken it so the curve can go straight. Right. Yeah. That was the theory. And they did it on, I, I can't remember how many patients they did. It was an old study. I can't remember the exact sample size, but what they noticed was every curve progressed. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> every curve got worse. So what did it tell you? That the muscles are a reaction to the curve. Okay. It's not necessarily the cause. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know that muscle, the, the sclerosis patients don't have a muscle pathology. If they do, they have a syndrome, you know what I'm saying? A connective tissue disorder. So the muscles are reacting. It's thinking about a scoliosis patient. And you know, you actually said this on your website too, was to practice yoga asymm you know, asymmetrically. Mm -hmm. You actually mentioned that. Yeah. And I think you're the first website that I saw that actually said something like that, um, which I totally agree. Because if a patient has a curved spine, to think that they're gonna have balanced muscles on both sides, and that would be normal, they would fall down. It's kind of like having a car with, all the passengers on one side of the car versus the other for the car to stay balanced. They got to have stronger tires over here, stronger shocks mm -hmm. over here, more everything over here to hold the balance level so it can go down the road. So to think that a patient would have a curvature and to try to achieve complete balance is actually the wrong goal, right? It's about achieving function for that curve that that person has. And yeah, we want to reduce it, but we want to reduce it within the range that they can reduce curves, right? I mean, there's a, um, and try to make that function the best it can within that patient's means. Mm. And I think that's where, I think that's what you meant by practicing asymmetrically, right? I think that's what you meant in your, in your, in your blog post. And so that's what I, that's what I believe it way should be taken care of um, because it's more of a reaction to what's happening to the, to the spine or to the curvature than the cause. Mm. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I would, the way I would approach this is, is I would, um train the person to to auto correct as much as they can yeah. mm -hmm. and then you know obviously it that w might look different if i do um a yoga pose on one side then i would do it on the other side that's what i mean yeah. by by practicing um asymmetrically just because, right. yeah. yeah i know exactly what you're talking about because we do self-corrective exercises too or auto correction exercises too um and it's the same thing it's an asymmetrical contraction Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, and that's where a lot of people who don't know about scoliosis fall short is they try to, they try to pre 
prescribe or do things symmetrically. And that's not the way it's supposed to be done for a scoliosis patient. Mm. So I don't necessarily disagree with this statement, but I don't think the asymmetrical muscle tone is what one of the causes, main causes are. Um, in fact, we tend to think it's more of a reactive reaction to what's happening as a symptom to the curve itself, mm. as opposed to a cause. Yeah. So one of one of the exercises that uh, Dr. Fishman recommends is is the side plank, mm -hmm. and he 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 is saying um, you should hold it on the convex side. So it, he says it's most effective for lumbar curves, yep. and um, you should hold it on the convex side of your lumbar curve. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I've and just so you know, you know, obviously I have a complete you know chiropractic clinic, so we have the use of X-rays and stuff like that. So I've taken X-rays of people doing planks to see how much it actually reduces the curve to see, and it works in some cases. And in some cases, you see no change in the lumbar curve. You may see a change in the lumbar curve. You may see a worsening in the thoracic curve. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it's it's not unfortunately it's not all people fit in this one category, no. right? Guy, you know, um, and that's the scary part about scoliosis is that somebody will read something. And they assume that, okay, if it worked for that person, it worked for mine, my curve. And honestly, I've taken care of over 30,000 patients in my 25 year career. And I no two curves are the same. Mm. I mean, they may look the same on an x-ray, but they move different. Yes. They move different. And um, so even if they look the same on an x-ray, they move very, very different. And the movement is what matters. And the only way you know how it's moving is to evaluate it properly. Yeah. Not just say, okay, I'm gonna, that person has an S curve, so I'm going to do the same exercises that that person has. I'm going to do the same ones, and it should yes. work for me. Yeah, that's that could be scary. I know this is always when. So sometimes people send me their X-rays and and say, you know, here's my X-ray. What shall I do? And I, I always say, well, we are not just an X-ray. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's so much more that you have to take into consideration. You know, I don't know what how you move. I don't know what your lifestyle is. I there's so much more that um that you need to take into consideration just um you know the x-ray is just not enough it's just one small part of the puzzle but there's so much more for yeah. sure you know i get the same thing i have a lot of chiropractors who send me x-rays just like you and say you know give me the one exercise i need to do for this patient like i go the x-rays yeah i mean they're important don't get me wrong but that's only one component of a complete evaluation right mm -hmm. and then just because we have a curve size doesn't necessarily mean or a shape doesn't always answer all my questions, right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, I could talk to you for hours. Are you okay for time? I'm, <laughs> I'm not... okay. I got a full hour blocked out, so we're good till noon. Yeah. <laughs> good. I, I just want to see, um, just to make sure that we're answering all the questions for for sure. the people that uh, made the time to to be here. So Alexander is saying, could could scoliosis and kyphosis be fully managed and improved on patients in their 20s, thanks to exercising and chiropractic? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, the oldest patient I've ever taken care of with the most severe curve has been a 95-year-old nun, believe it or not, with a 120-degree curve. Wow. Right? And, and uh, as far as I know, she's still alive. It's been, she's 101 now. And she's still holding her reduction from when we did it with our initial intensive care and our home care and our home therapy. She's seeing a colleague of mine up in, uh, in Northern Florida. Um, so yes, it can be reduced. The older you are, the harder it is. But my, one of the most successful results are actually with the young adults that act proactively. Mm -hmm. Because, and I think that's the most important thing is that the sooner you start taking care of your scoliosis, the less you'll have to deal with later. Um, I always tell patients, best case scenario, say we can you know, reduce your curve 20 to 30%. Let's just throw a number out there. Well, that means for every three degrees you progress, the most I can take away is one. Well, what if I never let those three degrees happen? Right? It, that's a that's 100% reduction, right? Yeah. Got it? So I would say if you're in your 20s and you can and you start on a program to manage your scoliosis, manage your kyphosis, and don't let it progress more thing. So I know most of your probably your listeners are probably already dealing with pain and dealing with symptoms and dealing with pro problems already. That's why they're searching. But I wish I could talk to the people that have scoliosis and don't have problems yet, because those people we can make the greatest change for over the longevity of their life. But it's sometimes it's hard to get our brain to think. Let me take care of it now before I feel it. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. yeah. I always tell patients, it's kind of like, well, are you going to wait to brush your teeth until you feel a cavity or are you going to brush them not to feel cavities? And it's the same concept, but for some reason we accept it with our teeth, but not with the rest of our body. Mm, I know. And that's the, that's the number one thing or the number one regret I hear from, from people in their, in their fifties and sixties. And they're like, I wish I had done, done something earlier on. Um, yeah. and not just now when I'm starting to have serious problems. Yeah, me too. Same thing. Uh, that's when, you know, so young patients, young 20, their spines are still relatively flexible. You know, they haven't gotten a lot of degeneration. Normally they're more motivated than like a 12 or 13 year old. So they tend to follow my instructions better. So some of my best corrections, some of my best pre, pre and post x-rays are with patients that are fully mature, but in their early age, like early young adults, like between 18 and 25 um, have been some of my best results ever. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, one of my, uh, one, one that won an award is a young, a young uh, adult. Uh, she was like 19 and she was from Canada. And I mean, the amount of change that she had on her, on her posture and her ribs and her spine was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because um, she was just disciplined and she did it. And she had still had a relatively flexible spine, which really helps us. Mm -hmm. Right. There you go, Alexander. So you've there, you've got a good chance there to uh, to do something about it. Good, uh, lovely. Right, Debbie is saying, "Wish I didn't hear that." What what was that, Debbie? <laughs> Tatiana is saying, "How about um, I saw on YouTube some people with scoliosis lift weights? Can it help for for straight core and stop progressing scoliosis?" I saw somewhere as well that you've got some experience in weightlifting, isn't it? I'm yeah, sure so I, I, I actually have a certification, level one certification with USA Weightlifting. And mm. um, so I'm a big fan of any exercise patients can do with scoliosis because the stronger their body is and the healthier their body is, the better they're going to respond to treatment when they choose to do it. Because remember, we're unlike surgical approaches where they're cutting muscles out and cutting bones out and strong screws and they're forcing your spine into a position we are using the person's body to help correct their scoliosis mm -hmm. so the better they are the stronger they are the better they're going to respond um, in severe cases compressive forces can be detrimental um, because that can lead to more compression it can cause more pain but those would be like using you know like super heavy bar squats something like that that's super compressive but general weightlifting I don't think is an issue at all. In fact, I would encourage it. Um, I would definitely say the more fit, the more, the more stuff you do, the better you are, as long as it doesn't cause pain. Yes. My rule, my rule of thumb is if it doesn't cause pain for more than for, for longer than two hours after you do it, in most cases, it's okay. If you do something and it causes pain for three or four days, don't do it. Not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. Um, that's, that's typically, if it causes a little bit of pain, but it resolves itself, you know, that's, that's part of exercise, mm -hmm. right? If exercise is a stress. That's what it's meant to be to help mm -hmm. your body react to that stress. So we have to expect something, but it shouldn't be long lasting. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Um, da -da 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 -da. Okay. So good evening, Christine. I was searching the internet just last week for chiropractor only. Are you sure chiropractor can help severe scoliosis, say 90 degree kind of? And you were you were just talking about um, your lady yeah. who's who had a hundred and something degree yes. curve, isn't it? Hmm. it? Again, it's not necessarily in my advice to her. It's it's not just chiropractic care. It's going to yeah. be a complete scoliosis and rehabilitation. So do I think getting a chiropractic adjustment is going to straighten a 90 degree curve? I do not. I do not. I think it can help her with her pain and discomfort, just like any type of therapy would do. But if she wants to try to reduce a 90 degree curve, it's going to be a very deliberate approach. Mm -hmm. It can't just be come and get adjusted once or twice a week and your spine's going to get straighter. That, that will not happen more than likely. Mm -hmm. Could I be, is there isolated cases? Sure, but not consistently. Mm -hmm. um, to get a consistent reduction in a curve that size in an adult requires effort, right? Effort. And, and you know, I always tell patients scoliosis is the most difficult spinal condition on the planet. So if it's easy to reduce, it's not true. Mm. <laughs> Got it? it takes very, very deliberate effort to reduce that curve and it requires, um, a, it requires discipline and a, and a very um, coordinated effort with everything that that person is doing to get the very best results possible. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, so my my last question <laughs> is so in terms of your of the the exercise that that you're kind of prescribing with with your program. Um, where where is this coming from? Is this is this similar? Can I'm trying to imagine it? Is it similar to kind of Schroth's um, exercise? Is it um, kind of mainly standing up exercises, or or how does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and and, and I'm glad you asked that because again, exercises have a big variance. <laughs> In exercises. So we use all of them, interesting enough. Um, I think they all have benefits. So we use something called reactive exercises. That's something called neuromuscular reeducation. A reactive exercise is like an unconscious reflex mm -hmm. where we use, um, you know, levers and a way to stimulate the body to, to move itself into a corrected position, like a reflexive exercise, you would call it. That's option one. Option two is that we also use isometric exercises for specific areas of the body, mm -hmm. maybe the neck or the mid back where a patient will consciously think about doing something that's not necessarily corrective for the whole spine, but only for one area. So a specific isometric type of exercise for a region. And then we also do very things like you were mentioning, like a, like a self correction or an auto correction where a patient would try to do a full correction of their whole scoliosis symmetrically throughout their whole body while performing another activity. And then the last thing we use is something called molding, which is a molding exercise where a patient may be laying down on a mirror image style of, of blocking and pushing into those blocks. And that's kind of like an also form. So we use all four types because why? Because all four types have, have provide different benefits. Mm. So um, I never, when it comes to a scoliosis, I never rest my, my trust on one thing. <laughs> because it, it, it affects the muscles, it affects the ligaments, it affects the bones, it affects the nerves, it affects balance, it affects all those things we're talking about. So we throw everything we have at it to get the best reduction. And I think that's why we get the changes that we do on x -Trust. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I wish I was closer to you. I would totally come and see you in Florida. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. I, I wish you were too. I, I, could, I could use your help here. Yeah. Uh, I could help here. Right. Thank you so much for for your time. This has been so amazing. And um, again, I could talk for hours, probably I have so many questions for you. But um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for everything that you do. Um, I think it's it's such an important work. And there's so many people that need your help. Yeah. And you know, I, of course, thank you for inviting me on and I encourage all your, your listeners to, you know, keep being proactive about their care. Um, you know, keep participating and keeping their body healthy and fit. So, you know, yoga is one of the very, one of the exercises that I always recommend scoliosis patients, especially adult patients to do because it's very low traumatic and I think it's, you know, beneficial for them. So keep being proactive and be, be, keeping engaged. Even if you're feeling better, don't stop doing it because the more you do it, the more you can prevent problems later on. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So there's all, all of uh, Dr. Nalda's links are in the, in the um, description below, but what's your preferred way of people getting in touch with you? You know, they can either contact the Clear Scoliosis Institute or contact my clinic directly at Scoliosis Reduction Center. Um, that's the best way where you can get, get in touch with me. And, you know, the good thing is with Clear the Scoliosis Institute, our goal is to, as a nonprofit, is to educate doctors to perform the type of treatments that I do excuse me, in my office. Mm. And so we can replicate this process. It's not just limited to this, my clinic, you know, we have 30 to 35 offices worldwide. Right. Um, unfortunately, we need a lot more, but like, you know, scoliosis work is very demanding. So uh, a lot of doctors may not choose to do it, but we're trying to increase our numbers and get more doctors certified. Mm, great. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. And thank you for having me on. That's all right. Thank you.